Today I want to talk a bit about dynamic scoping in Racket. Um, this is a feature I talked a bit about when I introduced the notion of uh, lexical scoping. And today I would like to revisit it in, um, but as a usage example. Because dynamic scoping is available in Racket, and this is a feature that is not very common in uh, programming languages, but I do think it deserves uh, some attention. So in this example, this is the example we started from, but we have um, uh, the same program, and I'm trying to show you in terms of a test case, what is the difference uh, in terms of semantics. Okay, so if you run this program, and this program is um, following, uh, all variables are following the static scoping semantics, uh, aka the usual normal semantics, uh, the expected output of this program would be 23 plus 1. Uh, why? Let's figure out. Uh, it, we have a function f. Function f is capturing this x here, that is defined above and the y is a parameter. So it's going to add 1 to whatever parameter you give it. Um, so in this case, I'm giving uh, this input, which is uh, 20 plus 3, right? This addition right here. Uh, so because I'm adding 1, 20 plus 3 plus 1, the result would be 23 plus 1. Okay. So this is the expected semantics. Nothing semantics. Nothing too surprising in this in this piece of code. Um, now, if we interpret this program with a dynamic binding, the output would be twenty three plus twenty. So let's try to understand why. So the point here is that um, if a variable, if you are executing this program with uh, the semantics of dynamic binding, then the x here. Which is um, which would be capturing uh, the regular static scoping rules would not be captured. Okay, so basically this x becomes a parameter of the function. The value of x is defined not upon the function's creation, right? So the the function is created here, and that's when uh, in static um, scoping that's when it captures x. But with dynamic scoping, it does not. So you effectively have two parameters. One is y and the other is x. So when you call g, you redefine x to be 20, right, in this, in this particular context. So the closest definition of x at runtime would be x assigned to 20. Therefore, uh, the whole result of this is still 23, nothing new. However, when you add it to x, x is going to be uh, the x highlighted in yellow, and therefore you will have 23 plus 20. Okay. So why would you want this, right? Why would you really care about dynamic binding? It seems very counterintuitive. Um, why, what would be interesting examples of dynamic uh, scoping? Well, dynamic scoping has uh, a few uses, and I'm going to show you uh, some in terms of, I'm going to give you a few examples. Uh, you're going to use it uh, for homework six, but also um, I will show you a paper that gives a few more uh, examples and motivation. Um, so the two main ideas I want to convey is that uh, dynamic scoping allows you to have a controlled way, a very expressive way of defining global variables, right? So if you think about your code, you have like something like uh, system out print LEN, or system out right in in Java or uh, stdio and std out and std error uh, in C or in Python, right? You have these defaults, um, and generally it's very clunky to change them. So if your code, if you have some code that changes uh, that variable, if that variable can even be changed, um, well, then code starts breaking, right? Because uh, if it doesn't behave in the same way, it might start uh, breaking and you might introduce an error uh, when you call some program, um, which is problematic, right? So the idea is um, 
it would be nice to have a, a way to control global variables uh, such that you could uh, override them just in particular contexts. That's the motivation. So you want to have globals, but you want them to be global within a certain context, right? A certain execution context. So I'm going to make that a bit more clear by means of examples. But one obvious way this, this is useful is for instance, when you want to write testable code, right? Because you could say that I have some implementation of a function. Um, and then I want to make that uh, parametric, I want to somehow change it when I'm testing it, because uh, maybe I haven't implemented that function or something like that. So that would be one example. And I'll show you uh, in terms of code, how do you would you achieve that? Okay, so how do we write? this pseudocode, right? This was not a uh, correct code. How do we write it in Racket? Uh, we write it with the following syntax, and I'm going to change to um, change to the example. Okay, so this is the Let's see if you can read this. Okay. This is the original example. And now I'm going to create it in 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 Racket. So in Racket, what do I do? Okay. What do I do? I have to create a special uh, thing called a parameter. Okay, and the parameter is essentially assigned to a regular variable, right? So x, but it will behave in a in a non-normal way. So when I create a parameter, I, I will initialize it, right? So I'm saying that x is assigned to one. Okay, and to read the contents of that variable, I have to call it. Okay, so pretty much like a thunk, for instance. So in this case, when I call f of y, I want to read the contents of x. So I have to call x. Okay. Uh, and now my g, if you remember, g, I wanted to redefine x to be 20. So how do I do that? I have this special construct called parameterize. And in parameterize, I can parameterize one or more variables. So in this case, we only want to redefine x. Okay. Uh, so what I do is I um, redefine x to be 20. And in and within that context, y is defined uh, to be three, and this is a regular variable. So then when I invoke f, I read the contents of x, which should be 20, right? Because it, from this, these three lines of code, there was no redefinition of, of x. And then when I call f, it's going to access x, the parameter. And when I read um, its contents, it should be 20. Okay. So first, let's see if this works. Okay, so this works. Uh, but maybe you're not convinced. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just print out the variables. Okay, I'm going to print out L before. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same, but outside. Okay, let's see what happens. Oh. Okay, so the problem is that display ln needs to show. Okay, let me do this without magic because I haven't explained what tilde is. So I'm going to write before. And then a little space. I'm going to just print out the variable. Okay, and now I'm going to write after. Okay, I'm going to do display ln.
Okay, so let's see if this works. Oh, I want to return the value somehow. Right. Let me do actually this way. Okay, so I'm calling before I invoke function g, I'm going to in I'm going to read the contents of the parameter. And then after invoking g, I'm going to read the contents of the the same parameter. Let's see what happens. Okay, so it shows that before and after the value was one. Okay. Um, let's also print it here. Okay, call it inside, you'll notice that inside is 20. Okay. Uh, and outside here is one. But if you don't trust me, I will do it again. Okay, so before is before calling G. Then inside G, before I'm inside the parameter, G, uh, X is assigned to one, and then inside parameterize, X is assigned to 20. Okay, so the way I imagine uh, a parameter in my mind, the way you could implement it is with a stack. And essentially, whenever you parameterize, you push another value to the stack. That's how I like to imagine it, because uh, and each parameterize represents a push, Right, where you would do push tw 10 and then at, at, at the end of the parameter of the parameterize block, you would do uh, pop of X. Sorry, pop. That's how I imagine it. Right, where, where here you would initialize the, the list with the stack with Uh, not 10, 20. So the list would be something like this, right? And then you pop and it becomes one. That's how I like to imagine because you don't lose the old value. The old value shows up again. So before is one and after is one, which means that there are multiple values of X, right? Depending on the context. Um, yeah, so this is how you use it. So I rewrote the example that was pseudocode and now it's real racket code. And what you can see is that you have to introduce this notion of a parameterize, which just creates a new context in which we redefine X. And we saw how to initialize um, the parameter, the dynamic variable, with, which with this idea of make parameter and you initialize its value. And whenever you do parameterize, you redefine a context. So if I were to do parameterize, x to be 10. Now the value would be different, right? Because I would be redefining it again. Uh, and now I get 43, right? So if I do inside f, inside f, I would get, um, oops, forgot to print. So inside F, um, I redefine it to 10. So therefore, inside this context is 10, which means that the whole thing uh, changes its meaning. But I'm going to undo that just to convince you that everything is working. So this, uh, and also to show you that it show, oh, parameterize works nested. And you can have, you know, it's within this block, you are redefining it. But if you have inside another parameterize, um, then in, within that block, it will have yet another value. And this is why I was saying that it works like a stack. Okay, so this is basically how parameterize works in, in Racket. That's pretty cool. Uh, but why would we want it? Uh, and the idea is that you might want to have uh, controlled globals. So for instance, a classic example is you want to control um, the standard output. 
right? So let's let's consider that in, for a moment that you would want to, for instance, let's say you have a program that you want to run. Uh, if you execute it uh, in, in the, OS, the OS call is called system. So if you execute a process with system, it would print out the the output, its output to the standard output. But for some reason, you want to store that into a string. There's a very obvious way you could do that uh, in Racket, which is you can use parameterize for that. Uh, so in this example, follow example. Let me comment this out so that. Okay. Follow example. Following example. What I do is, um, okay. Don't need this. Okay. First thing I did was uh, the so the standard output in Racket is called uh, the out output. Oh, sorry. It's called uh, output port. Okay. And it is, it's called current output port, and that is a parameter. Okay, so the standard output is always available in this parameter called current output port, uh, which means, okay, so I'm going to uh, comment this out, comment this out. Okay, so if I run this program, the only thing it does is it prints to the screen, hello world, All right? I have a... a a function f, I can even make it a function. Define f, okay, the only thing that f does, it prints out a hello world. Actually, I'm going to call this hello world. Okay, so this is some function called hello world that by some way, it prints to the standard output hello world. Oops, I need to call it. Hello world. So when I call it, it prints out hello world. Right? So now what I would like to do is save the output that was written to the standard output um, into a string. Okay, I can do that because I can, in record, you can create um, an output stream. So this is the, 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 value, the record value that works as, uh, basically you can redef redefine um, the standard output using something that behaves like a send out output, but actually is saving uh, that output to a, to a string, if that makes sense. So that is known as an output string. Okay. So let me kind of break this down. Okay. So first I need to introduce that. Let me introduce that. So you have, you can create an output string. It, it has the same exact API as the standard output API. So in C lingo and in uh, would be a file. So it would be, this would be the equivalent of something that works like a file, but is actually whenever you write to it, you would be writing to a string. Okay, so in the, in the Java world, I think this would be the, the abstract class would be an output st stream, if I'm not mistaken, and this would be output stream string or whatever. So the implementation that saves to a string. It's great for testing and for other purposes. Um, okay, so in this example, I just created an output stream, if you will, uh, that will, whenever you write to it, it will write to a string. Uh, and you create it by calling function open output string. Okay, so now if I want to write to it, I can use f print f. Okay, so the F here is saying that I'm saving it to a file. The file I'm going to use is going to be buff. So this is a, a pseudo file, if you will. Uh, and if I write to it, of course, nothing happens. Um, now I need to do some require. Ah, hello world, I haven't defined it. Yes. Okay. So it's the same variable. Okay, so I printed to the to my pseudo file, buff, and uh, of course nothing happened. If I want to read its contents, I have to call uh, get output string, and I can read what was written to it. So if I do that, I get that it was written foo because that's what I wrote. Right. So if I do uh, some text, this is what should show up. Okay. Of course, it doesn't need to have a end of line. 
and I can even display it directly to the screen if I want. Okay, so you see some text, which is what I wrote here. Um, and I print it by creating a pseudo file, uh, doing an f print f to that file, and then reading the contents of that pseudo file, converting the contents to a string. And then I did display to show that string. Okay, so now I want to do something similar. But what I want to do is I want to save the output that was written, that was printed out when I called hello world. So what I can do is I can param tries to redefine the standard output and assign to it my pseudo file. And now hello world is going to write to it. So if I read the contents of my buffer, what will I see? Well, I will see hello world. Right? So let's do that one more time. Recap what we did. So first we created a pseudo Okay. Two, we redefined the standard output to use our pseudo file. Okay. And three, we printed out the contents of our pseudo file. Okay. So in the contents is hello world. Why? Because when I call hello world, I'm printing to the output which is then redirected via this parameter to my buffer. Okay. As you can see, this is pretty cool because you can have, um, you know, you, I didn't touch my original function. My original function was just printed to the screen. And now I can capture whatever output was stored to it uh, by overriding current output port. Um, and this is very useful and can be done to Overwrite all sorts of uh, features of the OS, usually, uh, or interactions with the OS. Uh, so in, in Racket, you can uh, read and override the command line parameters using that. You can set formatting options. You can register like more um, different implementations to print structures, override the output and error stream, and so on. So next, what I want to show you in a future in the next video is how to use dynamic binding to improve testing.